Hello and welcome to the second and last session of our workshop CFD for Green Building by SimScale in collaboration with the Qatar Green Building Council and the German Green Building Association. Today we will talk about thermal comfort for occupants and continue our journey through the world of engineering simulation, how it, it can be used for green building. My name is Milat and today I will be one of your co-hosts for today's webinar. I'm a product marketing manager at SimScale and as a part of my role I am preparing and hosting different kind of learning opportunities like workshops and webinars on a regular basis. Today with me is uh, Hamuda Yosef. He is the head of communication at the Carter Green Building Council and as a green building and engineering veteran, he is an expert when it comes to talk about standards or, or different strategies for green building. And today he will share with us his deep knowledge about thermal comfort and how it can, should be considered during the design period of a building. Before we start with our today's topic, let's take a quick look at our agenda. So um, I will just quickly discuss with you some very few organizational things and then uh, Hamuda will introduce you to the principles of thermal comfort. You will learn about different standards, different ventilation strategies, uh, and how um, thermal comfort is, is impacting the performance and productivity of people inside buildings. After that, we will uh, increase our knowledge about computational fluid dynamics, and I will introduce you to some very important fundamental concepts of physical modeling, so you will learn how to treat turbulence, wall-related defects, and also how to avoid some very popular mistakes when it comes to use CFD. After that, we have again a very ni nice live demo, and this time it's a real industrial project by a, a big uh, international uh, building company, and they agreed that we can show the results with, with you, which is really nice, and I'm sure you will learn a lot about the practical applications of CFD for thermal comfort, and finally, we'll have again a Q&A session. So in the case you have questions, just write them into our question box. And Hamuda and me will try to answer them uh, on the fly in the chat or during the end at the Q&A. Yes, let's, let's not lose too much time to talk about organizational things. Uh, just to, to wrap it up. So you can basically earn two things joining this workshop. The first thing is a lead CE hour. And to receive this, you need to join the live set webinar session. And uh, today, we, or tomorrow, we will send out the, the first bunch of, of certificates to, to participants of last week's sessions. And you can also qualify for pre -pro free professional tra sims training by SimScale with a value of 500 euro. For this, you need to fill out and submit both quizzes. And we already had a session last week. Uh, where we send it around the link to a recording, the link to the quiz, so you have still time to submit the quiz. And for next week's session, we will send out the material end of this week. All right, and now um, I would like to um, announce Hamuda's presentation about the principles of thermal comfort. Hamuda, um, yes, thank you very much for joining, and the stage is yours. Hello Milad and hello everyone and uh, thanks for uh, joining us today for the second session or of our CFD. Uh, let me show my screen and go for the full screen. Yeah, put that to the side. So uh, last week we spoke about the energy efficiency uh, and passive design principles. This week, uh, as Milad has mentioned, we will focus more into more of the indoor environmental um, quality uh, and later on Milad will showcase more of the CFD of thermal comfort. So to cover more of that topic uh, we will discuss uh, two different topics in general but that are uh, fully connected. One uh, it's the indoor air quality and how to measure it, what kind of benchmarking do we need uh, to use and references and then how this leads to thermal comfort and again the references, the best practices, and things to consider uh, from a design principles before going to simulation. So why do we care about buildings or the indoor overall? Uh, it's very basic because we simply spend more than 90% of our 
uh, lifetime uh, indoors. Uh, and for that, we have lots of uh, actually pollution sources that are more concentrated within the indoor. Uh, and that's the tricky part, that many parameters of the indoor air may actually be worse than outdoor air due to the concentration, lack of air movement, uh, or poor ventilation in general. But the good side of the story is that we have more control over the indoor environment, and that, hence the importance of understanding the ventilation principles and how we design our indoor um, ventilation system and mechanical systems. Uh, so yes, we can have more issues with the indoor air quality, but in the same time, we have more control of actually mitigating these uh, issues. And speaking of negative impacts, the poor air quality actually impacts lots of things in our bodies, and that's part of the trend now. Uh, if you are aware of the will rating system and other rating systems that focus more into wellness and well-being and directly connecting the building physics with the building with our body block or building sys uh, body systems. Uh, so from the respiratory system to immunity and urinary and other reproductive system, we have lots of impacts uh, that can be affected by poor air quality and contaminated air. Things like uh, sick building syndrome, allergic renters, hypersensitivity phenomena, and many more. Other pollutants of concern, like carbon dioxide, and depends on the amount of concentration of carbon dioxide, and that's very important because we will discuss it later with reference to the ASHRAE standard and the minimum fresh air requirements. Uh, the exposure, long exposure to high concentration of CO2 within the indoor environment actually has been proven to have moderate to high level decrement to decision making, to attention, uh, initiative, task orientation, and lots of uh, cognitive, additional cognitive uh, skills of our body. So, and you can feel it there if you are in a poor, poorly ventilated space, which equals to having a higher uh, level of carbon dioxide. You can feel more of laziness, feeling more tendency to sleep. It's not the sleeping, but it's a way of your body not getting enough oxygen, uh, enough uh, to to deal with it. Other sources of Poor indoor air quality comes from inadequate, inadequate ventilation as a main uh, reason. Then you have contamination from the inside of the buildings or from outside air, like airborne dust and others, and microbial contaminations over the building fabric itself, which is something that we tend to uh, forget about. Overall, the WHO estimates that more than 12.7% of deaths could be avoided by improving the ambient air quality within uh, the space. And that's by decreasing the burden of respiratory diseases, uh, decrease healthcare costs, decrease uh, lost workforce productivity, and, and if you put it in the positive side, increasing productivity from uh, staff, and of course, increasing life expectancy. So, it's to sum up this part. It's to say it simply: improved air quality actually impact. Uh, offset the sick building syndrome and increase our productivity and will well being within the space. If we take it further um, to things like lead and lead V4 uh, for buildings and construction, similar to last week, we are looking at uh, the breakdown of the topic from a lead perspective, from a rating system perspective. So, for instance, in lead and in indoor environmental quality, you have many topics that are covered, speaking from making sure of um, providing the minimum indoor air quality performance, linking it with environmental tobacco smoke control or limiting smoking within the building as a source of contamination, then taking it to the enhancement strategies, uh, mitigating air pollutant source, sources of air pollutant like low emitting materials and construction indoor air quality management plans, then doing proper indoor air quality assessment, later on then going for designing for thermal comfort and lighting comfort and uh, acoustic performance as well. So there are several topics to cover here, uh, from indoor air quality to lighting, acoustics, and occupant experience. But for today's sake, uh, we will be just focusing on uh, indoor air quality and thermal comfort. So to go to the principles and the references uh, of first the indoor air quality principles, let's go for what type of ventilations are we starting with? And that's one of the early stages 
uh, design stages that you need to take um, with your architects and your electromechanical engineers. What, how are we going to ventilate the building? Uh, can we do it as a natural ventilation? Is it mechanical? Is it mixed mode? It depends on the weather, the culture, the function of the building, the, and the expectation of the usability. There are lots of decisions that need to be taken. Um, for mechanically ventilated space, we have a reference, uh, two references, if it depends on where you live. Uh, the ASHRAE standard 62.1 uh, 2010, that's the American uh, standard, and you have the CN standard, the European ROM uh, 15 2051 uh, and 13 779. These are the European equivalents. Of course, if you are in a country and you have the, another alternative or another equivalent, you can still use the th same as long as you maintain the main principles uh, and benchmarks. And I believe this will be something that Milad will reference more as we go for the uh, setting up the model for thermal comfort at later stage. If you are going for a naturally ventilated space, you have the ASHRAE 62.1 as well and the SIPSI um, uh, Manual 10 of March 25. So there is nice reference in the uh, SIPSI. SIPSI is the Chartered Institute of Building Services Engineer. Uh, so they have the application manual, which is called the AM10. Uh, in there, there is a nice, a very good flowchart that I would highly recommend that even if you're not a mechanical engineer as, as a, or an architect, to have a look at because it helps in setting, uh, answering the question, what kind of ventilation is suitable to our building. Uh, so it's flowchart with decisions yes or no, and once you start following it, you will end up in the, show the pointer, at the end of it, Yes, you can go for natural ventilation, or you need a mixed mode, or you need a comfort just for cooling, and so on. Um, it depends, of course, on the maximum heat gains. Uh, does the building has a narrow plan? Uh, consideration for parameter zones. Is it doable for mixed mode, except or not? So it's it's a nice guideline, which I highly recommend that you check if you haven't done before. So. For each room and space, and that and that's a way that you can do that. You don't need to have a single ventilation system uh, for the whole building, but you can do it per space and room. It depends again part of your strategy and design. So you can have a mix of both between uh, different systems on the on the same building. So for each room and space, and for space, it's up to the function of course of the space. Then you set up your ventilation strategies, your ventilation zones. You need to understand that your net occupable space and occupancy category and function and activities and design occupancy as well. What, how many people are expected to work and, and function within that space. For mechanical ventilation, uh, you need to consider some options. Uh, can we bring 100% outside air or not? The amount of fresh air within the system, uh, the system capacity for dealing with fresh air, uh, is it the uh, air displacement, is it was uh, under floor, overhead or side distribution, uh, the location of the turn grid, uh, supply air temperature, your setback temperature, is it uh, a variable air volume, which for short is VAV, or constant volume supply, is it, does it, more, is it more dynamic, is it more responsive, or is it more constant? Um, and from there comes the standards, again back to the standards that we have seen from early on. So for instance, if you're going for a lead project to um, comply with the uh, indoor environmental quality, uh, quality prerequisites or minimum indoor air quality performance, uh, you have two options, either to go with the American standard, which is the ASHRAE 62.1 and complete the ventilation procedures for each system or go for the European standard 15251 and follow the calculations in Annex B. It's for both of them it's way of doing your calculation depends on where you are. So to keep the to keep the highlight or the highlight the main issues in the in this calculation, first uh, compare the calculation with your design airflow, making sure that you meet the minimum 10 CFM per person, cubic feet per minute uh, per person. Ensure minimum requirements are met, incorporate equipment into your HVAC design. So you're taking these kind of uh, design requirements and integrating them into your HVAC design. 
The main thing is maintain 10 CFM minimum per person for all occupied spaces. This is the minimum amount of fresh air that you need to provide per minute, which is cubic feet minutes uh, per person. So this is a minimum that you need to maintain at all time to avoid issues that we mentioned earlier, like the increase of uh, carbon dioxide concentration and their negative impact. For naturally ventilated spaces, you need to provide a mechanical ventilation backup in case there was not enough air movement or the temperature is going too high or there is extreme climate change uh, in the weather conditions. Uh, you need to have monitors uh, to monitor the natural ventilation systems from the direct uh, exhaust airflow measurement devices, uh, alarmed opening for natural ventilated spaces, and carbon dioxide monitors. So again, we need to maintain, uh, as we mentioned from the early slides, uh, that we need to maintain good air quality within the space. So regardless of the, your system, uh, is it naturally ventilated or mechanically ventilated or mixed, we need to monitor the carbon dioxide, we need to monitor uh, the airflow and making sure that we have enough uh, required. So in there, identify the ceiling heights and opening, perform natural ventilation procedures. And again, this is where uh, it will come in handy, uh, similar to what uh, Milat showed last week, uh, for the air movement using uh, CFD simulation to actually assess the feasibility of natural ventilation, is it doable or not, without taking the risk to actually discover it on site. So making use of your simulation tools to take this decision on early design stages. You have enhanced credits uh, when you follow these principles, which is to provide enhanced indoor air quality strategies. And for that, you have a mix, depends on your uh, system, either mechanical, natural, or mixed mode. So picking a couple of um, strategies that can come far from using entryway systems, uh, preventing cross-contamination between interior spaces, adding extra filtration, uh, doing extra calculation for natural ventilation, and so on. Increased ventilation rates beyond the 10 CFM, uh, installing carbon dioxide monitoring, um, and doing room by room calculations. So that's more or less is the part of the indoor air quality. Now, let's take it to the next topic, uh, and the final topic from my end today is the thermal comfort. So, speaking of thermal comfort, and people tend to confuse thermal comfort with air quality, and these are two different topics. Uh, but thermal comfort actually, if it's too warm or too cold in, within the space, you can actually link it to increase of productivity and performance uh, in, in different spaces. And actually, they have different references and different standards. Uh, so for thermal comfort design, you need to follow ASHRAE 55, 2010, or later, or the ISO and SEN standards, the relevant ISO and SEN standards. So you need to select and design condition strategies. So it depends with your, what we call the compliance considerations. What kind of functions are we doing within the space? Uh, and connecting that with how are we providing the air uh, and temperature and air movements. And that's, these are the kind of considerations. So you have actually five considerations to take care of. One is the surface temperature, two is the air temperature, and second is the humidity, then the air movement or air speed within the space, and finally the metabolic rate and clothing, so the function and clothing within the space. Together, these five uh, compliance considerations, you can then design for a proper thermal comfort, putting them together uh, in, in line. So for mechanical conditioning, we need to understand or design for what's the indoor oper operative uh, temperature, the humidity levels, the airspeed levels, the occupant clothing, and activity levels, as we mentioned before. Examples of thermal control from thermostats to ceiling fans, uh, adjustable underfloor diffusers, task mounted controls, operable windows. People need to have um, control on the space. Of course, there's uh, personal subjectivity between each person. Uh, people, some people might feel a bit warmer than others. People, others might uh, be more um, welcome a, a colder environment. So we need to provide this kind of controllability for each occupant. Uh, within uh, different spaces. So again, 
to put it, uh, to keep it in our mind, what kind of consideration does it determine the thermal comfort of the space? As we mentioned, metabolic rate, clothing, humidity, air speed, and rated temperature. So with this in mind, uh, we need to bring these two concepts, or not to forget that this, these two concepts are totally connected to everything that we have discussed so far, even last week, from the passive design principles, promoting daylight, uh, promoting um, a proper indoor uh, environmental quality is fully connected with your site, is fully connected with your energy strategies and water strategies and so on, and material selections and so on. So there are lots of synergies and you can't isolate uh, a design strategy from another, especially in the green buildings uh, realm. So that's mostly it for my end, Milad. And thank you, everyone. And please let me know if you have any questions by in the uh, if you can drop a question uh, in the uh, menu or drop us an email. Thank you. Milad, are you here? Awesome. Uh, thank you very much for this exciting presentation. And let me just make myself again the presenter. All right. You guys can see my screen? Yep. Perfect. Okay, then let's continue. Thank you very much, Hamuda, and we will talk later during the Q&A. So, um, now let's talk a little bit about CFD and some further fundamentals. Last week, um, we got an introduction to the idea of computational fluid dynamics and how it can be, be used for green building projects. And first of all, let's today talk about some aspects which become very important when it comes to simulating internal air flows and simulate thermal comfort. And the first thing is turbulence modeling. And um, turbulence is basically not, nothing more or less than a chaotic change of the field values in space and times. And um, a lot of people um, have some misconception because they think that a vortice and turbulence is the same, but that's not actually true. And a good example for a turbulence floor is if you take a look at a water tap, and when you open it a little bit, you will see that there is a uh, 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 flow com flow uh, uh, it's water coming out and if you take a look at at the profile of the boundary in phase between the water and the air it's like very smooth and thin and as more you open the tap as as more you are increasing the mass flows through the uh, tap and therefore the the uh, fluid flow velocity and if you open it up more and more you will notice at some point that first of all the um, the cross section uh, will become wider, and then also the surface becomes more rough. And as as more you open the water tap, as more chaotic and rough uh, the boundary uh, layer, or let's say the fast uh, layer, uh, fast boundary between the water and the air will look like. And this is a very good example because actually there is not something like a unit for turbulence but there is a Reynolds number which is a dimensionless uh, number and it's basically the ratio of the inertial forces which are the product of the uh, velocity the characteristic length of the flow and the density of the fluid and the viscous force are represented by the viscosity and the viscosity and the density are material properties of the water basing based on the temperature and if you increase the velocity the Reynolds number will become bigger and bigger and there's a critical number around 2300 and around this number of flow become turbulent and basically all the flows which are used in technical devices and also which are relevant in buildings are turbulent flows and turbulence is massively improving uh, the distribution for example of heat and therefore it's something we need to very careful simulate and, and just to, to finish this example, if you, let's say, change the, the fluid and you would use oil, which has a mass, mass much higher viscosity set of water, uh, the, the flow would still become, again become laminar, since now the Reynolds number will drop. 
And if we think about turbulence, and I told you that basically all technical relevant flows are turbulent flows, it brings us to a problem because let's say this is the value of the any value, for example, the velocity or temperature at a point. And then this is a graph representing how this value changes over time. And one way to deal with that is to say, well, I will calculate an average velocity and now I'll I will introduce something new, which I call the flux of velocity. And this is basically a function which is representing the, the fluctuation around this average value depending on time. And this is quite smart. And But it comes still with another problem. These oscillations here, they occur on very different time and length scales. And what I mean with that is that at some points, the value will change very rapidly and quickly, and some others very slow. So we have different time scales. And length scales means that we have maybe a very small fluctuation at the point of the flow field, where, like independent from the high, how fast it's changing, the amplitude of the oscillation is very small. And we will have some regions where this uh, amplitude is, is quite high. And this brings us to a problem because we, since we have very small length scales, it would take us or it will come with very, very high effort to solve all the small scales. And this kind of simulation where you solve all the kind of small scales is called DNS, direct numerical simulation. And it comes with so much calculation of that it's basically not not available today for any technical relevant flow. There are some 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 research projects where they try uh, to do DNS maybe of a simplified car, and it takes them like months or years to to solve the simulation. And so, what can we do? One thing we cannot do at all is re to resolve these fluctuations. But there is a very smart approach, and this is based on replace the oscillation, so we will not consider them further, and introduce something else called a turbulent viscosity. And how does it work? Well, I have, from last week, you know that we use different equations, or there are different governing equations which need to be solved, including the conservation of mass, energy, and momentum. And in the momentum equation, the, the viscosity is used. Or it's depending on viscosity, let's say this way. And now what we do, instead of using the physical viscosity for this equation system, we will introduce something new called uh, effective viscosity, where we will add something called turbulent viscosity. And the idea now is that the effect of this oscillations will be considered indirectly through the effective viscosity. And this turbulent viscosity has no physical meaning, so it's not a material property of, of the fluid, it's just artificially introduced to, to simplify the problem. And the only thing we need to do now is to introduce at least one additional uh, transport property because the equation system is not closed. And this is, this is fulfilled by in introducing this turbulent viscosity. And there are a turbulence model available which makes, uh, which enable us to, to simulate turbulent flows in a affordable, with an affordable effort. The only thing you should know is that turbulence modeling is a simplification and therefore there is no turbulence model which is generally valid for all kinds of flows. For example, there are some turbulence models which are very strong for shear flows, some others are very strong far away from the, from the body, and uh, during all, for AEC applications, we recommend, by the way, to use so, the so-called K omega SST model which is quite strong for, for both regions, uh, far far field and, and, and near field of, of the flow. Another aspect which can become very important is wall modeling, because as you might know, uh, we have something called the boundary layer, and it's the result of the fact that the air, which is directly in contact with the surface of the object, is basically sticking on it, and this will decelerate the flow in the near of, of um, the wall compared to the free stream velocity. And this will lead to, here's an image visualizing the boundary layer 
at the opposite side of the airfoil. And here you can see schematically like how the velocity profile is looking. So this is the wall. Here the velocity is zero. And then we have this profile. And everywhere where we reach 99.6% of um, the, the ambient flow velocity, uh, we have the free stream. And everywhere where it's below, it's the boundary layer by definition. And what is happening is that this boundary layer has a strong effect on the on the global flow field. And the problem is that, as you know, we use this element, the cells, to resolve gradients. And in the, in the near of the wall, in the boundary layer, we have a special effect. which me, uh, And this effect is that uh, we have a very strong velocity change in y direction, in this direction, in the vertical direction. But in the horizontal direction, it's very, very small, the change of velocity. And therefore, we need to resolve directional change of velocity. And one option would to be a, use a lot of small elements. But since this is a weight of computational resources, instead, we use this flat cells, which are optimal, op, op, uh, optimal for resolving uh, this, this, let's say, a major gradient in one direction. The only important thing you need to know is that you, should, you need to apply these elements on all outer walls, but never on physical, non-physical walls, like inlets or outlets. And to in, whenever you use the cells, it's very important to use the same, the, the right height for the elements. And this height is mainly depending on your Reynolds number. And this also comes with another problem. Because if you take a look at how the velocity is changing against the wall distance, you will notice that you would need a lot of small elements to, to really resol properly resolve this complex profile. And this usually also increases the computational effort. On the other hand, for a lot of effects, you can simplify it by using wall models. And one thing we use a lot of times is the so-called law of wall. It was like, I think it's nearly 100 years old, or, or 60 at least. And the great thing about uh, it's a very unique and interesting idea because what they what they actually did is uh, researchers um, experimented a lot and measured for a lot of flows the the velocity profile in the boundary layer, and they found out that there's a generic way to describe velocity close to the wall and that you can use the function which will give you the dimensionless velocity depending or as a function of the dimensional wall distance. So what we have here is basically velocity versus wall distance. And if we make both dimensionless, it will give us a, a relation which we can reuse. And now the idea is, instead of resolving this complex profile with a lot of cells, we'll just use one flat cell, which will completely cover the whole so-called viscal sublayer. So we have three layers inside the boundary layer. And this viscous sublayer, it can be replaced, where we have the, the biggest change actually, replaced with a velocity profile, and this will solve, uh, this will reduce the computational effort. There is just one thing, it requires a very specific y plus number, so a very specific distance of the first cell to the wall, which is depending on, on the velocity and some, some other things. And if you don't have a wall function, you need to reach a wall uh, y plus of 1 for the first layer, which will lead you to much more cells. All right, now let's talk a little bit about very common errors in CFD. And just to make it clear, the biggest source of, of errors uh, is basically the user. And the most, the, the biggest kind, let's say, of, of, of errors made by users are modeling and setup errors, which means that you oversimplify something which is physically not possible. And another thing which happens a lot of, and just to give you an example, uh, if you, for example, use there is a turbulence model, or if you don't use a turbulence model, or use, if you use a turbulence model, which is made for, let's say, laminar flows, and flows turbulence. This is a typical. Or if you try to simulate something uh, as a steady state simulation, which is a transient process. The next, or let's say the second biggest source of errors are so-called discretization errors. And this is related 
with the inadequate or bad mesh. And this basically can have two reasons. One is that your mesh is too coarse and you're not able to resolve uh, uh, gradients, which are physical, very important. And in every case, it will lead to bad results. In the, in the worst case, this can even let your simulation crash. And another thing which people usually do wrong is say that they use wrong domain approximation. So let's say, the, the, for example, if you do a natural ventilation simulation like we did last week, if the bounding box around the building is too small. And the third kind of error, which is not happening so often, or let's say it's not very usual for, for simulations which are not super complex, is, is to use wrong numerical settings. And actually, just to simplify it, um, in difference to what analytic methods do, we work with numbers here, and this number needs to be rounded. And sometimes during the simulation, we need to solve a numerically a, a algebraic equation system. And if we use the wrong settings, it can happen that we get an error. And just to show you some some prominent examples, so this is a typical error made by, by beginners. Let's say your job is to simulate the flow on a step. And what a lot of people do wrong, actually, is that they want to save elements. So they cut the domain very early after the step. And what will happen is that the vortice is outside the domain, and this will lead to a, to a problem. Because um, the boundary condition will also not properly work. And in this case, a lot of times you get wrong results or even your simulation crash. And the right solution would be to do it like this, to at least make sure that uh, the, big, the wake behind the stair is fully developed. And yes, also what happens a lot of time, and this is quite similar, is that people uh, put the inlet or the outlet too close to the area of, of distance. So this problem usually happens for external aerodynamics. And if you have internal aerodynamics, internal flow, let's say we have this pipe system, this HVAC system, and we're interested in what's happening here, we need to make sure that the flow can fully develop because usually you don't add the boundary layer to, add, add to the inlet boundary condition. The flow develops itself, and so you have to make sure that there is enough way upstream for the flow to develop. And this is an example which you maybe will not deal with since multi-phase simulation is, is not very common for green building, but this is a good example for really physics, for, for not taking physics into account. Let's say you want to simulate how a, 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 fuel, a fuel cell is filled with, with fresh fuel. And let's say what you obviously need is the inlet for the fluid entering the container. But a lot of people forget that you actually also need an outlet for the air in the container to, to escape. And if you forget about this, at some point, your flow will stop and stop because numerically or mathematically, it's so much air inside this that it that can't leave. And this is, by the way, not then the, the, the result does not need to be physical, by the way, because some people would say, well, but in reality, what if I don't have an opening here? Well, that's a good point, but it's a simplification. And um, if you, for example, want to simulate the case where there is also physically not an outlet here, it will become much more complex and you really have to think about how, and then you have to do a compressible simulation, for example. So, and in the end of the day, why I'm telling you this? I'm telling you this because it's, you know, very easy to create some, some colorful, smooth contours, and they can be basically produced by any model, even if it's independent, if it's good or bad. For example, in a lot of movies, if they have CGI or animations, including fluid flow, it's not based on a physical simulation, so it will look super nice, but the results usually are absolutely not physical. And it's your responsibility as a user to first understand the problem and then make some, some let's say, inherent assumptions before setting up the simulation. And usually, before starting to use the SimScale platform, you should sit down for half an hour, think about the problem, and write down how you want to solve it.
And in the end of the day, whenever you get a simulation result, don't trust them. Don't trust them in the bl blind or something like that. So try to compare the results, make sure that they make sense from a physical point of view, and if possible, try to compare them with analytical calculations, hands-on approximations, or let's say um, well-used based object on your experience. And now let's switch to the live demonstration and I would like to show you a very interesting project we uh, did on a consulting base for the international construction company Ramble, which is known for a lot of very important and, and famous buildings like the Ferrari World, in, I think they're in the Emirates, uh, or football stadiums, the Copenhagen Operia House or the Jakarta Four Seasons. And uh, this time, Ramble was working on a new building from the Queen's Ferry, Queen's Ferry High School. And as you can see, this is a, a school in Scotland with a quite modern concept. And um, here you can see the sketch of how the classroom should look like, also with the, with the chairs and the tables inside. On the right side, you can see the, the initial design for the HVAC system. And since this is a school, thermal comfort was a big issue. And so they contacted us because before they were using only hand calculations and they asked us to help them and if we can simulate uh, uh, the mixing box system case in a winter scenario where the windows are closed and the fan is on. And to, to help them, we provided them with qualitative and quantitative results, which were including the velocity distribution, the temperature distribution, and the thermal comfort inside the room, based calculation calculated based on the ASHRAE 55th standard. And in the case you've missed your, your last week's session, I would suggest you should watch after the webinar, the recording, um, because since we all just have 20 minutes left, uh, I w won't explain everything again, which we discussed last week, but just to put it in a nutshell. So we have again three steps. The first step was that we needed a CAT model. So Ramble provided us with a, a Rhino CAT model. Uh, it was quite easy to, to, to simplify it. So we made sure it was watertight and we introduced some dummy bodies to simulate the heat transfer from the, from the students. In the next step, we prepared the simulation, so we mashed everything, uh, run the simulation with SimScale, and finally we, we proposed processed the results, visualized them, made them countable, and used these results together with the customer to take design decision. Let's now take a look at the CAT model. So, um, we have different things included here. So, first of all, we are simulating the humans inside the room as well as uh, obstruct obstructions like chairs. Uh, we also have some, some inlets with grills where we, and here you can see what I told you, that we actually had to add some, some volume to the domain here at the inlet to make sure the flow can develop. So we have uh, two inlets with grills here. We have uh, outlet ducts here. Sorry, these are the outlet ducts, so here's the, and Three is are the inlets, is the inlet ducts. We have some radiant panels, and in addition, also we have some light, which also reduces some heat. And for the cat preparation, as I mentioned, we ex extended inlet and outlets. The model was closed, and very important also to, to first of all keep bodies as and parts as separate solids, that, so that we can assign different boundary conditions, and also to make sure or to understand that we need the volume inside the room and not the, the volume of the walls, etc. So it's kind of a negative of, of the cat domain. So the first step was to create a proper mesh. We used surface and feature re refinements to adapt the mesh refinement in, in regions where we expect to have high gradients and change of the flow field. And you can see like we re refined the edges of small parts and the surface of, of obstructions like chairs and, and the tables. And we ended up in a 20 million cell 3D mesh, so in the end we will have for 90, or 90 million, for 90 million points we will know the pressure, individual pressure 
and temperature value. And it just took us 40 minutes to calculate the mesh, uh, since we can use up to 96 computing costs. Here you can see an overview of the simulation setup. So for sure it was air, we used a convective heat transfer solver, which is steady state and includes turbulence. We also included gravity, which is important when it comes to natural convection effects. And as you can see at the inlets, we're introducing uh, um, the air was 1.25 meters per second, which will reduce in a, in a um, mass flow based on the cross section. And the outlet, we are like sucking out the air with um, 0.031 cubic meter per second. The side walls have no slip. They have a constant temperature of 294 Kelvin. The humans are like uh, uh, re uh, some, uh, re uh, releasing some heat as well as the windows, the lights and the radiant panels. And now let's take a look at the CFD results of the design. So first of all, you can see a, a slice in, in, in X direction. We are uh, visualizing the velocity. And what is quite interesting is that first of all, the high velocity flow through the diffuser grids creates a kind of strong draft, which we can see here. And you can see here that we have some buoyancy effect. So the air around the humans is heating up, the density drops and therefore it rises up and get sucked in by the, by the outlet. And um, you can see we basically have three thresholds for the flow velocity. So the flow is entering the room with 1.25 meters. Inside the grills, uh, since the cross section is, is, is dropping, uh, the, the flow velocity increases up to 2.1 meters per second. And in the region where we have buoyancy draft, it's quite low from 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 meters per second. We can now move our slides a little bit and then we can again see that there is a strong buoyancy effect around, around the, the, the occupants and that we have natural convection due to the cold windows. And this is also very interesting. If you want to do such analysis, as Hamoda mentioned, you need actually to do several simulations considering different ambient temperatures. And, and, uh, and at least you do to do a simulation for winter, summer, autumn, and so on. And it's basically quite similar what is happening here. Um, and if we even move the slide to the end of the room, it's everywhere the same. Like we have again this draft regions. We have this high velocity here, which is not very comfortable. If you do re directly like stand here, but here is no chair from that point of view, it could be fair. And we again have buoyancy and natural convection. Now let's uh, rotate the slides by 90 degrees. And now we have Y normal slides and let's take a look at these two sections again via visualizing the velocity. And you can see that the fuser growths actually work quite well in that uh, manner that they are like ensure that the, the, the flow is spreading. And the outlet ducts, you can see that they actually like taking air from everywhere. So even from the walls, especially to the convection and some air gets sucked in. Now let's again rotate it by 90 degree um, around the y-axis and now we can see it set slice against velocity for, for the shoulder and the above head level. And for the shoulder level you can see that we have some high velocities in the near of the inlets because they interact with the walls and then we have these waters. And uh, you can also see that the, the average flow velocity around the, the humans, especially at shoulder level, is between 0 0.1 and 0, or is below 0 0.2 meter per second at least. Now we can use some streamlines to visualize the, the uh, path of the flow for each side. And the, the inlets are released from, as uh, the, the path lines are released from the inlets and you can see how the air dispersed slowly, goes through the room and then gets sucked in by the, by the outlets. And this is some other views where you can really see the complex um, structure of the and you can like, and what I really like is the visualization of those fast descending air columns for the inlets and how they are mixing inside the room. Now let's take a look at the temperature and you will use the same slices. And here you can see like the, the cold air and how it, becomes warmer when mixing with the, with the air inside the room. You can like see the, the, the velocity profile uh, and the warmer uh, through the heat flux with the occupant. 
and we have a very even temperature at people level. Here it's basically the same again if we move the slice. And what is very interesting here is that um, the outlet air is quite warm and that's exactly what we want. The outlet air is around 300 Kelvin while the air in the room is around 295 degree or Kelvin. Sorry. Now we can take a look at the Y normal slices and the temperature distribution. We can see again that it's coming cold air from the inlet which, which is mixing and that we have heat from the radiance panels here and here which are, and this could also be a good explanation for for the air which is going from the walls uh, and, and inside the, the outlet. And now this is very interesting we can see the temperature distribution at about above head level and at about shoulder level and at shoulder level it's more or less around 296 Kelvin, while at or above hot le uh, head level, it's it's a little bit, little bit higher, around 297, 298 Kelvin. And actually, we have a large difference in the average temperature, especially here. So we have a lot of hot spots on on above head level, uh, and it's not as extreme as, as on the left side, but for the right side we also have some of the seat islands. And yes, and if we know, we can like calculate the average temperature of occupants and it's like 315 Kelvin. And now let's try to take a look at the contours for a temperature of 296 Kelvin. And you can see like we have this hot air uh, above the people and like at the last 30% of the height of the of the room and that the warm air from occupant bodies rises which is good and we want to keep the air where it is. Now you can see a temperature slice 20 centimeter from ground level where the temperature is quite low and now let's at the same point do a horizontal take a horizontal uh, perspective and you can really see the temperature profile and how it's uh, influenced by the heat released from the human bodies. Now let's take a look at the temperature profiles for, for different places for the room below the inlet grill, uh, the center and below the outlet. And here you can see it's very similar to the velocity um, um, velocity profile so we are plotting it the other way around with exchanged axis and you can see that actually below the inlet grill is a much different profile and for the center and and below the outlet it doesn't make a big difference. Now what we also did is we calculated the effective draft temperature which is described in the ASHRAE 55 standard and this can be calculated based on the local uh, airstream temperature, the average room temperature and the local airstream strength to line velocity. And the great thing is that as long as this EDT is between minus 3 and 2 it's comfortable and you can see that everything which is dark really which is orange from orange to light blue is okay. And you can see that there is just one guy in an uncomfortable region, the, the, the student directly sitting above both the, the, the outlet. And for sure here where the, the inlet is, it's quite uncomfortable because of the combination of uh, high velocity and low temperature. And we have the same effect if we go at another point of the room for these two occupants. And again, this uncomfortable region at the above head level where we have the inlets. And if we now use the Y slice, we can see again that we have this uncomfortable regions below the inlets, also from the other side. But on the other hand, uh, where the people sit, it's basically everywhere comfortable. And now we again use the slice at about head level and one at shoulder level, which shows that the shoulder level is uni uh, uniformly comfortable, but above the head level there are some spots which are uncomfortable here for example or here but they seem to be far away from the people since they are sitting most of the time. 
yes, the simulation was performed in 32 cores. It took 22 hours to, to finish, so 700 cores at all. And together with the mesh, it took 780 core hours to run the simulation. And in return, we received a lot of interesting insights uh, about the temperature, the velocity distribution, and based on the simulation, we can first of all, we now are sure that the concept will work and we can further improve it in terms of further increase the thermal comfort or uh, decrease the energy needed by increasing the flow rates and the, the temp. The, and yes. All right, I hope you enjoyed the second session and I basically answered most of the question, but there is some 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 unanswered question which I would like to discuss with you now and feel free to add further questions. All right, I think the first question is for uh, uh, is by uh, Luis Montoya and he wants to know if you can use SimScale with a Revit file. That, yes, Luis, it's absolutely possible. We also support a direct Autodesk uh, import. Regarding a direct Revit import, it will be available soon, but in the meantime, you can use a lot of exchange formats which work well, like STEP, um, for example, or Autodesk, other Autodesk formats. And Nidhi Mirota wants to know um, uh, if there is an online training available. And in the case you miss it, Nidhi, there, we have several trainings and by submitting both quizzes you can qualify for a free training. And um, yes, the other questions were answered on the chat, so if there is um, nothing left. Wait, there is a question by Rashika Rai and the question is if natural ventilation necessary for unoccupied space like storage rooms. Maybe this is something where Hamuda can uh, give a good answer on. I mean, if uh, any space or any room, if it has one occupant or access by one occupant, it needs to have some sort of ventilation. It doesn't need to be natural, but you need to have some sort of cross-ventilation. Uh, uh, cross uh, because if it's a storage room, if you have any chemical, for instance, if you have any chemicals in the room, you, need to, you must have uh, a ventilation. Either it's natural or mechanical, you need to have some sort of air movement within the space. Uh, for other storage areas, you might not need to, but at least uh, you need to have, in case, I mean, even from a health and safety perspective, uh, you need to have air movement. You don't need to provide direct ventilation, but you need to have cross-ventilation from other rooms uh, if needed. Uh, so that's basically, uh, in principle, the, the design requirements. Uh, but, of course, you can find more details if you go to the ASHRAE standards or the SIN uh, standards from that case. I would like to cover another question as well that came across uh, regarding the uh, information about the uh, lead for existing buildings, uh, credits for indoor uh, air quality, and I uh, and thanks for that question, and I'll make sure to add maybe a slide next time uh, that cover this topic, uh, but in principle, they're both the same uh, in the main principles of uh, minimum indoor air quality, uh, the, uh, controlling the uh, smoke and tobacco control. Uh, additionally, there is a couple of thermal comforts are the same more or less. The additional uh, topics that need to be covered, things re relevant to uh, green cleaning, uh, cleaning products uh, and how to make them more environmental friendly, things regarding to the pest control or pest management, the chemicals you are using, the way of you, uh, avoiding chemicals uh, or minimizing the use of chemicals uh, and providing more of natural uh, an uh, organic way of, of dealing with it. So these kind of topics relevant to the operational policies and how uh, during operation you need to minimize your source, uh, pollutant source of uh, pollutants and to get in touch with your occupants to understand you need, like for instance, in their in operational maintenance, you must have uh, or you need to do uh, an occupancy survey to understand people's pers uh, perspective on the thermal comfort, their, their and their satisfaction with it and what kind of uh, corrective measures that you can put in place uh, to put it in the right manner. All right, thank you very much. It seems like we answered all the questions. If you want to reach out to us, you can also send me an email and I will uh, forward the question to Hamuda or 
uh, I don't know, Hamuda, if, if you agree, we can also provide the registrants with yes. your email address. All right, yeah, perfect. Can. We will add it to the email, which includes the recording. Yes, thank you very much for joining. We had a lot of attendees, and I know that it's quite late for a lot of you, and the weather is very good, so we really appreciate that. Hope to see you soon again, and have a wonderful rest of the week. Bye.